Hi, my name is Elisa and I'm a technical support analyst on the Vertigus Studio team. In this tech tip video, we'll take a look at some of the common form elements that are used in Vertigus Studio workflow so you can learn to design your own forms with confidence. One of the main purposes of Vertigus Studio workflow is to create a user experience that guides the end user through a series of tasks or processes. Forms help with this by offering an interface for the user to interact with. They are designed to collect inputs that can be referenced later in the workflow. To get started, we'll need to drag and drop a display form activity into our workflow. This activity is like a container for our form elements. On its own, it doesn't do much, but it gives us a blank slate where we can design the interface our users will see. When we double click on the activity, we are brought into the form editor. Here, we can see a modular outline of the form, a list of all the elements that can be added to it, and the properties of the currently selected element. For our first item of the day, let's take a look at the autocomplete element. The purpose of this element is to allow the user to start typing some text and be offered a list of suggestions based on what they have written. It's useful in situations where you need the user to select an exact value, but there are too many options to simply list them all out. For example, you may want the user to correctly enter a tax parcel ID from a database containing tens of thousands of tax parcels. To get started, we'll select the ArcGIS query option to populate our autocomplete suggestions. This is already set up to suggest field values from an ArcGIS feature layer. You could also start with the blank option if you would prefer to design your own sub workflow to populate the suggestions. Without touching anything else, we can already test out the autocomplete element in the workflow sandbox. The default data is coming from a US census layer and is set to suggest state names. So let's try typing the start of a state name. As expected, we get some suggestions popping up and the value gets filled in when we select one. Since you probably want your own data in the autocomplete suggestions, let's look at how to set this up. First of all, we will want to adjust the inputs in the query layer activity. We will change the URL from the default US Census feature layer to a local tax parcel layer. In the where clause, we want to change the state name field to the parcel ID field for our new layer. We also want to change the output fields. Let's just get all the data using the wildcard asterisk symbol. To keep our parcel ID suggestions organized, Maybe we want to set the order by fields input to the parcel ID field so that the suggestions get sorted alphanumerically. Next, we will want to edit the inputs of the get form element items from features activity. This activity is responsible for formatting the features so they can be displayed as items in a form element. We will change the label input, which decides what the user will see in the form element, to the parcel ID field. And that's it for setting up the suggestions. Back in our form editor, perhaps we want to change the placeholder text so that it's a bit more helpful. We can say we want a tax parcel ID and offer an example value. Now when we run the workflow in the sandbox, we get suggestions for local tax parcel IDs instead of US state names. If you're looking for a more basic text element that simply accepts whatever the user enters without offering suggestions, you could try the text box or text area elements instead. Next up, let's take a look at the date time picker. This, along with the other date and time elements, is a pretty straightforward component that lets the user select a date and a time. Though the element itself is relatively simple, dealing with the date time values can be a bit tricky. For example, let's say you want to set the date time picker so that it defaults to exactly three months from the current date and time. You would first need to add a load event to the element, which runs a sub workflow when the element is initialized. Since we want to date and time three months from now, we need to first define what now is. For this, we can initialize a create value activity with the JavaScript expression new date. It's important to use the new operator, otherwise the value will end up being a string of text with the current date and time instead of a JavaScript date object, which is what we need. Now, we need more JavaScript to modify the date we created, so we will want to add an evaluate expression activity. In it, we will want to get the current month, add three months to it, 
and change the month of the date object we initialized to this new value. Finally, we can set the value of the date time picker using the set form element property activity. The date time picker's value property expects a Unix timestamp in milliseconds, but our date is currently stored as an entire object. To fix this, we will want to use the value of method to extract the timestamp in milliseconds from the date object. When we run this in the sandbox, we see that the date time picker defaults to the current time at a date three months from now. And if we click on the little calendar icon, we can change it to a different value if we want to. The next element that is commonly used is the dropdown list. True to its name, this shows the user a dropdown list of all the items it contains. By default, it lets you manually configure the items, but you can also set it to use a sub workflow. One situation where this might be useful is if you want the user to be able to select an attribute value from a coded domain. To get started, let's select the blank sub workflow option. We will drag in a get coded value domain activity and feed it the URL of the layer we want. We also need to tell it what field has the domain. Next, we will want a get form element items from collection activity. This activity is a bit different from the get form element items from features activity we saw earlier because it can work on any collection, not just a collection of features. We will feed it the list of coded values, and assuming we want the labels instead of the codes, we will set the label input to name. Now, we just need to set the dropdown list items using the set form element items activity. When we run this in the sandbox, we get a dropdown list with the attribute values in our coded domain. Next up, we'll have a quick look at the file picker element. This element allows the user to upload a file from their device. It's pretty simple and very useful. One handy trick with this element is that you can restrict the file types that the user is allowed to upload by including a list of MIME types and file extensions. Let's say we only want users to be able to select plain text files, PDFs, and Word documents. We can include the MIME type for plain text, the MIME type for PDFs, and the docx file extension. When we run this in the sandbox and click the Add File button, File Explorer only shows us items that match the specified file types. Our next element to be showcased is the Geometry Picker. Again, this is a fairly straightforward form element. It allows the user to draw on the map so their input geometry can be used for tasks like querying intersecting features or adding graphics. This is a versatile tool that's used in a wide range of workflows. To get started with it, you can set the geometry type and the maximum number of geometries. When we run it in the sandbox, we can draw the shapes we want, and when we hover over the items in our list of geometries, they get highlighted on the map. Now, if for some reason we don't like the geometries we drew, we can easily delete them as well. Back in our form editor, let's add our next common element, which is the item picker. This element lets you display a collection of items to the user and, depending on how you configure it, optionally allow the user to select one or more of these items. The power of this element comes from the way it can interact with the map, which I will show you in just a moment. It's important to note that this element can only be populated using a sub workflow. If you're looking for a similar tool where the items can be manually configured, the radio group, check group, or list box elements may be more appropriate. Now, let's set up our item picker with the ArcGIS query sub workflow. When we run it in the sandbox, we get a list of states to choose from, which are coming from the same US Census layer we saw earlier. This is great, but it can be even better. Going back into the sub workflow that populates the item picker, let's set the return geometry property in the query layer activity to true. Let's also edit the label in the get form element items from features activity so that it's a bit more descriptive. We can use markdown formatting and put curly braces around field replacement tokens to give us attribute values. Now, let's zoom out a bit in the sandbox and rerun the workflow. This time, all the items get an associated graphic on the map, and when we hover over an item, it gets highlighted. 
Another thing that's great about the item picker is that as long as you don't set a value field name in the get form element items from features activity, the selected items will contain the complete features behind the scenes. This means you don't need to requery the features after the user has made their selection. You can access the selected features by simply referring to the value property of the item picker element. To show you what I mean, let's add a log activity after the display form. We will set it to output the value of the selected items in the item picker. When we run the workflow in the sandbox and select one of the states, our log outputs a list of selected items. When we expand the list, we see the state we picked, and when we expand its value, we get the data for the entire queried feature. Next up, we have the number range slider element. This, along with the number element and the number slider element, allows the user to enter numeric values. This can be useful for things like calculations since the values are already stored as numbers and don't need to be converted over from strings or other object types. A commonly used setting is the number format, which lets you decide how the number should be displayed to the end user. For example, if we set the number format to currency, currency symbols are displayed on the form and we get a new currency option in the number range sliders settings. Let's set it to Korean one. Other common settings include minimum and maximum values for the slider, step size, and whether or not to show tick marks on the slider. Let's set the maximum to 50, set the step size to 10, and enable the show tick marks option. Our second to last form element is the password box. As this name suggests, it accepts text input like passwords from the user and obscures the characters. This element does not require much configuration, but there is an important thing to note when using it. It does not perform additional security tasks like lockouts or encryption. Because of this, it's important to avoid using the password box for highly sensitive data. It's best to limit its use to data with low or medium levels of sensitivity and to find more secure ways of accepting values that would carry a large risk if they became compromised. Last but not least, we have the section element. This element is rather unique because its main purpose is to help format and organize the form. Adding it to the form allows us to separate the other form elements into segments. The style property changes its behavior. Without any style, it's essentially just a divider, but if we set it to something like tab, we can save a lot of vertical space on our form. Let's drag and drop the autocomplete and password elements under our first tab and name the first tab uh, text inputs. Now let's add another section, set it to a tab, and call it pickers. Under it, we'll add the date time picker, file picker, geometry picker, and item picker. Finally, let's add a third tab for the remaining elements and call it other. When we run the workflow in the sandbox, we get a much shorter form that is neatly organized into tabs. That sums up our topic for today, but a video on form elements wouldn't be complete without mentioning that it's possible to get even more form elements than what's available out of the box by either installing activity packs or building your own elements using the Vertigus Studio Workflow SDK. For more information on this, please visit our Developer Center. As always, thank you for watching.